going to make our way to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Well, eventually we're going to get to what will hopefully take us through a look at verse 6 through 16. One, I don't know about y'all, but I, anybody ever have trouble learning something? Well, I didn't say I did, but I'm glad to know that all of y'all know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, sometimes it's easy. I, I like to be shown something. So if I can get an illustration of something, I find that very helpful. Uh, you can read all the instruction manuals to me. Uh, and when I used to work on airplanes and they showed me the FAA manual, that's, yeah, I hadn't woke up. That's, that was a terrible day. But anyway, that's a different story for a different day. But I like, I, I can read, but if you show me something, it's much more valuable. And today what the Lord is going to give us in this chapter and, and in this passage is two illustrations. And not only is He going to help us see a picture and the idea of giving us an illustration, He's also going to help in another way that I really like to learn, and I'm glad that the Lord loved me enough to put this in the text, is He's going to do a compare and contrast. Y'all familiar with this? You know, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. That's kind of what we're going to see today. And what we're going to see is really the tale of two different worshipers. We're going to see one who Miss Terry uh, just sang about, a woman who we'll find out to be known as Mary. Her name is Mary. Uh, and she is a sincere worshiper. And then we'll see another one who we'll not only talk about today, but we'll talk about him uh, as the story of Jesus' passion unfolds through the rest of 26 and 27. See a man named Judas who is not a sincere worshiper, he is a self-worshiper. And through these two illustrations and through this compare and contrast, hopefully we will be able to also apply the same sort of metrics to ourselves and evaluate our own hearts and say, am I a sincere worshiper of God or am I a self-worshiping faker? We'll see. Let me... Uh, let me read our passage. We'll get into the work today and we'll see how far we get before one o'clock. No, I'm kidding. It won't be that early. All right. Chapter 26 and verse six. The Bible says, now when Jesus was at Bethany, the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. When his disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? But this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Literal translation is, She has done a great work. For you, have always, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has been done will be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot. And don't, no, don't boo when you hear that name. Just say, oh, bless his heart. He went to the chief priest and he said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment on, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Man, I hate reading about Judas. But, you know, if you read back through the book of my life, there's some parts I wish you'd skip as well. But let's do some work first on the sincere worshiper. Let's look at this sincere worshiper. What I love about this passage is in both of these accounts, uh, the, this woman and Judas, it's the beauty and the sadness are both really contained in the details of the story. And that's really what I want to spend some time on. First in verse 6, you, say, you see that uh, Jesus was in Bethany. That's a smaller town, just a mile or so outside of Jerusalem. About a day's walk from Jerusalem is what most people think. It is the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, the one Jesus raised from the dead. So Bethany was a point uh, in time, a, a real location uh, in the world where a dead man was raised to life. And the news of that spread. It was a very well-known place. So we've got this. Now, now we've got the place that nearly made verse 6 be the only thing we talk about today. Because I think this statement is incredible. And if you speed past it, you have missed one great miracle of God. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the what? Well, now, now, now wait a minute. That is an incredible statement that you just read. Do you realize that? Because here's the deal. Y'all know this. Leprosy was an incurable, outside of Jesus, clearly, an incurable skin disease which led to horrific endings in some cases. Terrible. But if you had leprosy, you were not allowed anywhere near 
people who did not have leprosy. You couldn't have a house in a city. You had to stay out. You were out of basically in the middle of nowhere or at best in a colony with a bunch of other lepers. You couldn't come near anyone. You had to shout unclean. You were never uh, allowed to have any social interaction until you were cleansed of your leprosy. And it was an incurable disease, so you... See, the picture is someone who would have, in all likelihood, and should have been an outcast from society from the moment he contracted the disease to the moment he was dead and fell on the ground. But yet, Jesus is meeting what we find out really is a party. He's at, there is a party going on at the house of a leper. Why? Because Jesus is awesome. Because even though this man had an incurable disease, what we know is if they are in this house... He was cured. Because God can cure the incurable. Is this breaking news to anyone? (laughs) He can take an impossible situation and He can turn it around for the good of all involved. Can you believe that? Is that crazy? See what I mean? Verse 6 nearly was it for today, but I figured we better make some progress. I love this statement. If you just run by the fact that He was in the house of a leper, you'll miss the whole point. So it really could be understood when you read it. He was in the house of Simon who used to have leprosy before the Lord Jesus healed him. But you, then, then you may ask yourself this question. Then why, is, why, why, why when Matthew constructed this gospel did he do this to this poor guy? Like he doesn't want to be known as the leper, right? Who wants to be known as, hey, you know, as the leper? Ew, that's, mm, that's not... That's not good. We don't want those sort of titles that pertain to our yesterdays of which we are ashamed. But history records, and Matthew records for us, this man, Simon the leper, with his scar blatantly printed right there that this man was a leper who was healed by Jesus. And why does it maintain it? Because just like his yesterdays, your yesterday that the Lord saved you from is a testimony of how good He is. See, what we'll want to do is we'll go through a situation, we'll get a scar, and we won't like that scar, and we'll take that scar and we'll hide it, and we won't let anybody see that scar because we're ashamed of that. But you know what that scar is? It's an indication of something Jesus healed in your life before. Now, I'm talking about literal scars, I'm also talking about emotional scars. I'm talking about whatever you've been through in life, what your yesterday used to look like that is different from how good and bright today is that He brought you from, that's a scar from yesterday. Don't hide that scar because it tells a story, not of how good you are, not of how good I am, but how great He is in every situation. Okay, that's the end of verse 6, y'all. Leave me alone about it. Your yesterday doesn't define you. I'm not done. (laughs) Your yesterday doesn't define you. It describes how good Jesus is. You got it? We're in good shape on that? Okay, well, let's get to verse 7. Here's the setting. They're at a house. Uh, There's people called to dinner. There would have been a gathering. They're all sitting around. Well, they're actually not sitting around. They lay around the dinner table. And they're eating. And in the midst of this picture, verse 7 says, A woman came up with an alabaster flask of expensive ointment. She poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. So if you're wondering about reclining at the table, now, kids, I'm not telling you you're allowed to lay down at dinner. But in the first century, that's what they did. They actually laid on their left side and they ate with their right. They would lay horizontal and eat. I don't know why. That's how I eat popcorn when I watch a movie at home, but that's about it. But that is the way they used to eat. So when you see recline, don't think anything of it. That's just what they were doing. But the picture is they're all laying around. In the midst of this, a lady comes in. She has a flask of expensive ointment. The word for ointment is actually a word for perfume. Uh, it's not so much like she poured grease on him. She actually poured what amounts to cologne, or think of it something like that. And she pours this on his head, So what we have is Jesus laying at a table, having dinner with a group. A woman comes in, which would have been very unusual. She pours something on his head, which would be very unusual. Just imagine me and Virgil sitting around at lunch. Somebody comes in and pours a bucket of cologne on Virgil's head. Anybody sees it is going to say, well, that sure is weird. But that's exactly what she did. If you go over to, and we won't turn there right now. We'll get there in a second. But John 12 also has a a version of this story where he gives us a a more detailed picture and he tells us that this is a lady named Mary. This ointment was a a very strong perfume and and it actually filled the entire house. If you wonder a little bit, well, let me tell you a little bit about this so you get the right picture in your head. So this alabaster flask, the way that 
perfume, we'll call it, was sealed in that day. Uh, it would have been sort of like the shape of a soda bottle, like a glass soda bottle. It'll white stone and, and it's thin necked. And to use it, you had to break the neck off. It was really a one time use thing, and you pour it out. Other gospels tell us that it was a pound's worth, so pretty decent amount. And she takes this and she breaks it open, and in that moment, it becomes the one time use. You, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. This is when it's going to be used. She pours it on his head. Uh, even John 12.3 tells us that she also poured it on his feet. So the picture is really more or less that she poured it on his entire person. And that's a weird thing. Let's be honest, that's a weird picture. And the disciples draw out an unfortunate and weird reaction. Verse 8 says, When the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? This could have been sold for a large sum, could have been given to the poor. <laughs> it actually could have been sold for quite a large sum. Over in Mark's version of the story, Mark 14.5 tells us that it was worth 300 denarii. Now remember, denarii is a day's wage. So 300 denarii basically is a way to reference, it was a year's salary for a normal day worker or a soldier. So what this cologne costs, I don't know how much your cologne is. I know some of y'all get it from CVS and that's okay. But I, I'm not, I, got, I, got, I broke Gina. But th imagine buying a cologne that cost your entire year's salary and you use it all at one time to pour on some guy. That's kind of the picture. You getting the idea? The Bible is real stuff that happens to real people. It's not myth and fables. You've got to kind of really experience the, the whole picture that's taking place here. So the disciples see this, and they're all upset about it. Matthew just tells us that the disciples saw it. They were indignant, wondering about the waste. Now, uh, two other Gospels also tell us the same account. And watch how the details change. Uh, Mark 14.4 says, There were some there, uh, who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? Then you go to Matthew's account here in 26, 8, and it says, when the disciples saw it, they were indignant and said, why this waste? Then you take yourself over to John chapter 12. John, who was with Jesus more than most any other, in verses 4 through 5, he tells us even more details, and he says, but Judas Iscariot, now remember, don't boo, say aw. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, we have this great thing this lady did. It's somewhat unusual, <laughs> some would say. And yet, it, what Jesus is going to call it a great moment. But you have what, who we know, some of the disciples were... We're sideways about it, but we know for sure specifically that Judas was bothered by it. And what you see is, is almost fake outrage, the way John puts it here. Why, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? It's really what he's saying is what a waste to use this on Jesus. What a waste to give this her best to Jesus is what he's saying. He says, why, weren't, why wasn't this given to the poor? Now, it sure sounds nice to say, why didn't she sell all this and give it to the poor? That sounds good. But Judas had really, and the disciples, and whoever had a problem with her, had no right to tell her what to do with it because it was hers. She saw the value in anointing Jesus with it. It belonged to her, so that was her business. And, and, and Judas and all these disciples, they want to make it sound like, well, giving it to the poor would have been a higher, more holy, more wonderful thing to do. But John doesn't let him get away with that. Because over in John 12, 6, he says this. John gives us the real reason. He says, no, no, no. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He had charge of the money bag. He used it to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas said all the right words. He even looked pious. Well, we should give this to the poor. Okay, well, it would have been a great idea. It would have been a decent idea if it was yours and you had any say about it. But it also would have been decent. It would have been a good idea if that was actually his heart in any way. He wasn't interested in worshiping God sincerely. He was interested in worshiping himself fully. In this moment, he lost out on a money bag full of an entire day's or entire year's salary. He wanted his hands on that. And when he missed out on it, it seemed to upset him. But let me point this out real quick. Show you a little, couple more pictures of this lady before we move to Judas. I, I don't know why I'm in a hurry to get to Judas. I don't like to talk about it. 
Verse 10 says this, Jesus is aware of this, that they were upset, that they're all talking these things, and that Judas seemingly is leading them to have outrage about what this woman's just done. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? The word trouble here in some translations is used as distressing her or uh, or hurting her. Uh, the root of this word is actually comes from the idea of beating. Now, they weren't actually physically beating her, but they were beating her with words. They were seemingly condemning what she did. And Jesus said, what have you done? She's done a beautiful thing to me, literally a great work. She has prepared my body for burial. He says, you will, you'll always have the pool with you, but you won't always have me here. I love this. Jesus is not in any way negating that the poor are important. Jesus doesn't think it's wrong to take care of the poor. He says, no, but they're always going to be here. I'm only going to be here a short time. And what he says here is actually a, a direct reference back to the, the command of Moses in Deuteronomy 15.11 where he says, They will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, the needy and the poor in your land. So what we've all got to understand is Jesus is not saying that this should have been given to the poor. He's not against the poor. He wants to help the poor. He's not. You know, we got it. Jesus isn't selfish either. You good? <laughs> okay. Me and Marisa are on the same page. The point Jesus is making is that He will only be there a short time. In just a few short days from here, He is going to die for the sins of the world, including my sins, including yours. He's going to die the death of a criminal. And because He's dying the death of a criminal, He's not going to have time for His body to be prepared before He's put in the grave. So what he draws here, even if this woman didn't have understand what she was doing, he says, what you've actually just done is prepare me for burial because I won't be able to have time to be prepared before they put me in the grave. What I love though, one last thing about this woman is Jesus clearly is, is blessed by this. Now She's done this to prepare me for my burial. And verse 13 says, Truly I say to you, whenever this gospel is proclaimed, the whole world, what she's done will be told in memory of her. What I love about that is, to Jesus, what she did was of extreme value. So much so, it's a memorial to her. Anytime the gospel of Jesus' death is, is told, this lady's memory of this act she did, of giving what she had, valuing Jesus more than her own thing, will be told throughout history. To Jesus, this woman came up, and even though what she did seem confusing was a puzzle to the crowd, to Jesus, He knew exactly what it was. He knew exactly what her heart was, and He knew in that moment what she did was worship Him sincerely. Now, on the other side, quickly, there is not a sincere worshiper, there is the self-worshiper. Now verse 14 picks up in a heartbreaking statement, one of the twelve. That's one of the closest to Jesus in the world. He had crowds that followed Him everywhere, people who wanted to kill Him everywhere, and yet He brought twelve men specifically to follow Him so He could disciple them for three years until He turned them loose on the world. And yet it was one of these twelve, whose name was Judas, who went to the chief priest. Now you remember these guys, we talked about them last week. They're the ones who just got together and started talking about a way they could end Jesus. They didn't like Him. They wanted a way. They were going to seek a way to actually destroy Him. And yet, at the same time when they needed some way to destroy Him, here's one of Jesus' own men who was willing to turn on Him. And if you read it that way, you think, well, what luck. But we read it on this side of the cross, and you know what it says? God's perfect plan was working out according to God's perfect timing. Because the time had come for Jesus to die for our sins. And so the reason this plot is actually starting to look like in the physical realm that it's working is because God, who is ultimately in control, has decided it is time for His Son to die for my sins and for yours. And His plan is starting to come together. And look at the question in verse 15 that Judas goes to him and asks. He walks up to him and he says, hey, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? It's a heartbreaking question. Judas walks up to these guys and he says, hey, what's, what's this guy worth to you? They're sitting around plotting. He says, what's he worth to you? And they pay him 30 pieces of silver. Now that's no small sum. If you kind of play it out to the money of the day, it was 120 denarii, so 120 days wages. That's pretty good. You take that at one time, that's a decent chunk of money. Interesting enough, the woman poured a bottle of cologne on him worth 300 denarii. So if you want to wonder 
which one actually saw more value in Jesus. One gave out and poured on him, wasted, <laughs> anointed him with 300. And Judas is willing to betray him for 120. Heartbreaking. 30 pieces of silver, though, is no random amount. It actually shows up in Scripture. Uh, one interesting place, one heartbreaking. I'll show you these real quickly. Uh, Exodus 21.32, if, uh, if you have an ox <laughs> and your ox run wild and accidentally gores a slave and they die, you have to pay the person 30 shekels of silver. So Jesus is worth, in essence, in this regard, the money uh, of a gored slave. What's even more interesting than that, and I don't, I don't have time to get into this, but let me just show you this real quick. Read it on your own. Zechariah 11.12 uh, Zechariah is having he, he's having a vision here of a shepherd, and the she it says the shepherd says to them, "If it seems to you good to you, give him my wages. If not, keep them." So they weighed out to him, and they gave him thirty pieces of silver. This was a way in this prophecy that's going on in Zechariah eleven. He is being rejected as a shepherd of Israel. So thirty shekels of silver, thirty pieces of silver, is the price of a rejected shepherd. Jesus Himself being the exact rejected shepherd. It ends heartbreakingly, verse 16, for this particular view for today. From that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. From that moment on, Judas is no longer interested in serving Jesus. He's no longer interested in learning from him or worshiping him in any sort of way. Now his entire life is spent looking for a chance, a moment to just betray him. Because he's not a sincere worshiper. He's a self-worshipper. So, what do these give us? These give us two very clear pictures of two very different people. One that would give away anything in order to be a blessing to her Savior. And the other one, looking for every chance they have to betray the Savior. Couldn't be a starker picture between these two. One, looking to give all they have. Mary, this woman having this uh, ointment, this perfume, this cologne, worth this much money, that really would have been what would have sustained her basically through her retirement. We're talking in that moment about a retirement plan. That's a 401k worth of ointment for Mary in this day. And yet she gives it all away to him because he's worth it. The question becomes, what do we have that we would not give up for him? And if there's anything you have that you won't turn over to Jesus, that thing is the idol that's running your life. Other side, we have this other man who doesn't want really anything from Jesus at all in a spiritual realm, but he wants anything he can get to gain from Him. And if, if there's anyone here, and if you search your own heart, you're honest with your own self, and in any moment you are calling yourself a follower of Jesus, looking to gain from your relationship with Him rather than to give, check your heart. Whatever that thing is that you won't give up is what actually rules you. And if you want to get from Jesus the cosmic vending machine, you're no true follower of His. You're no better than Judas. Best thing we can do today, and I'll wrap up with this idea, is come to Jesus wholeheartedly, intentionally, sincerely. And I mean that if you've never come to Him, come today and ask Him to be your Savior because it's a great day to get saved today. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, as I hope, believe most of us are, listen, we don't have time and the world's too messed up for us to be self-worshipping fakers. we got to get sincere. we got to get serious. And just like Terry said, I'm afraid she was going to preach my message early when she said, what you have, we've got to make that available to Him. Some people can sing. <laughs> Some people can sing. Some people can't. <laughs> Some people can give. Some people can pray. Some people can pray in a way that others can't. And just a special bit of faith that God gives some people. Whatever your spiritual gift, you don't have that gift in order for you to gain. You have it in order to serve, to give for Him. What are you going to give Him today? I hope it's everything you've got. Let's pray. Father, today, I hope is a day of challenge, but also I hope is a day of encouragement. When I look at this passage, I see... I see what I, I want to be. 
I want to be this lady who doesn't care what it is, it's yours. But so often I don't see myself quite that way. I see myself as someone willing to give you nearly everything. God, help me to take that nearly away and make that available to you as well. Lord, if there's someone here today that needs to come to know you for the first time, Lord, I ask today that you give them the strength to come to you. But Lord, for all of us Christians, brothers and sisters in the house, we all have been given supernatural things that you want us to use and give to you. God, lead us to know what those things are and to turn those back to you and to trust you for the results that will come from it. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me of my sins. Thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.